But I think that's it for housekeeping. So I'll give it over to Yvette and we can get started. <clears throat> okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I am speaking on behalf of the Academic Integrity Committee, some of the members which are, are over here to my left. Um, and we are all happy to answer any questions after the presentation. Oh, wrong computer. Okay. So one reason we wanted to think about academic integrity and exactly what we're doing in our procedures is because of the rapid increase in the number of cases that we've noticed over the last several years. So where in 2010 we maybe had 12 cases, we now have more like 80 cases. And so that starts to be a lot of people that, that we're dealing with that we want to make sure we're dealing with fairly and consistently and um, have really solid procedures in place for this. So one question is, are people cheating more or are people getting caught more? And probably the answer to, to both of those is likely yes. Um, although we don't, there's no way, no control case to really know um, which of those is true. We just know that we have a lot more cases than we used to. There are many different types of academic integrity violations. Um, I'll kind of quickly go through some of, the, some of the main ones. Copying, of course, is an academic integrity violation. Submitting another person's work as one's own or submitting another person's work without proper citation. That can often happen accidentally in, in a way when people are working in a group and they're not clear that they have to turn in their own individual assignment, even though they're part of a particular group. So I think being very clear in assignments and in your syllabus as well as to when something is truly something that's a group effort and everyone turns in the same thing versus things where maybe people in a group are all assigned a similar thing. Say one group has a particular case that they're looking at, but it's still an individual assignment. That can get kind of confusing for students and could lead to some of this. Um, unauthorized test possession, purchase, or supplying. We'll talk more about how that is being done um, in, a, in, in a kind of big way now with um, certain sites. So we'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. Ghosting, uh, where you pretend to be someone different and go take the test for them clearly a violation. Um, altering exams or assignments. Improper use of technology. So having your calculator when you're not supposed to, having your phone out when you're not supposed to. Um, so again, it's good to be very clear about what they are allowed to have out and what they're not so that people aren't caught you know, doing something they didn't realize was wrong. So the more, the more clear everyone can make the expectations, then at least we, can be, we, are, we are only um, you know, kind of catching people who really are trying to violate the academic integrity. Facilitating academic dishonesty by others. And I think students maybe don't always know that, that this is bad that they are in as much trouble as the other person if they do this. So giving someone your old exams or leaving your homework laying out so your roommate can kind of copy it, <laughs> you, are, you are still at fault for that. So that I think they don't really, because they did their work, but you can't give your work and let someone else have it. Submitting work previously used without permission. I think this is another place where students have some confusion because they wrote the paper, but they wrote it for a different class and they already got credit for it in that class. So they can't use that same paper in another class. That one, again, can be confusing because it's their work, but you can't, get, you can't double count it like that unless you have talked to the professor and for some reason are given permission to do that. Unauthorized collaboration, and here again, this is where it's important to be very clear about what is group work and what is individual work. 
And you know, we obviously like to have students have study groups. Um, I think they learn really well when they're all working on problem sets together. But in the end, the answer they turn in has to be their understanding of that answer. So some clarity about those expectations is again really important. And unauthorized use of study aids is clearly a violation. <clears throat> and these are described on that the link down there, um, or if you just Google sanctioning guidelines for academic integrity violations at Penn State, you would get to the um, to a, a, a very long list with a lot more description about what each of these are and what is considered a minor infraction and major infraction for each of these different types of violations. So um, this is called Know Your Students Heroes because there is a study site called Course Hero where students can upload their information. Um, so they can upload previous tests that they took, they can upload all their assignments from a course, and these are things obviously we don't want living out on the internet um, for, for other students to find. It is a, a violation of Penn State's policies for students to do that, but they might not realize that. Um, it's important that people use the newest version of the syllabus template because a lot of information like that is in the, the, the newest version of the template. We'll try to catch these kind of things and help, help professors have them covered if they were to happen in their class. So this could be both a, an academic integrity violation and also a copyright violation. Um, before we go farther, there are a few definitions that are important. One is the difference between academic sanctions and conduct sanctions. I think there was a word to neck font problem here, but. <laughs> it, well, yeah, it's fine. It just was one line. It looked a little, looked a little better, but, uh, but we can read it. Um, academic sanctions are are consequences that are going to affect a student's course grade. So like they, kind of like they sound. So giving a zero on an assignment, saying that they're going to have a reduction in their course grade by a, a full letter, things like that are academic sanctions. And again, there are good, pretty good guidelines for given the severity and the type of infraction, you know, what is sort of a recommended um, academic sanction to go with that. The other type of sanction is a conduct sanction. And these are really consequences that, instead of directly affecting a grade, kind of affect their standing as a Penn State student. So this could be uh, a warning um, for an academic integrity violation, probation, a notation of XF on a transcript, if they failed, they have to get an F in the course for them to make it into an XF, but it would indicate that the F was because they cheated. So it's a pretty serious thing to have on your transcript. And in, in rare cases or in repeated behaviors, um, it could lead to expulsion. And all of those are conduct sanctions. And the two are handled pretty differently. And we're really, as a committee, have decided to handle these two pretty differently. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, so conduct sanctions are implemented when cases are particularly egregious or there's this pattern of dishonest behavior across multiple courses. So when people start to have priors, then we start to think about what the conduct sanctions should be. So as a committee, we talked a lot about if someone does have a prior, what should we do with that? Should that automatically go into an, an increased academic sanction or should it go on the conduct side? And we have kind of decided as a committee that it makes more sense for each class to kind of, for that grade to represent what the violation was in that particular course. 
So you keep the original academic sanction that was, um, you know, um, that the instructor requested. But if there are priors, then you add a conduct sanction to that. So we're kind of separating the two. So as an instructor, you aren't going to be changing grades based on what happened in completely different courses a year or two ago. That'll be handled through the conduct side of things. And I think it's a cleaner representation of what the student actually did as well. Okay, so if you think that someone cheated in your course, now what do you do? The first thing is really to have a conversation with this student. It's possible there's a misunderstanding. It's possible they really were confused about the directions. Um, so have a, have a conversation. If you still believe that there was a violation, then you need to fill out an academic integrity form, which is shown here, and I'll zoom in on particular parts of it on the next slide. Um, give the form to the student and immediately send the form also by email to Martha Travers um, in the Ryan Family Student Center. That's important to do because then Martha knows when to start the clock because there's a five day time period for the student to contest. And um, it's, you know, this way you don't have to keep track of that. Like Martha is keeping track of that for you and she knows exactly when it ends. If they don't contest within that time period, then we assume that they are accepting responsibility for the violation. Yeah. So that form can be both emailed to the student or physically provided to the student, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. And the clock starts ticking. The clock starts by the instructor sign date on the form, and it's by business days. So at the end of the fifth business day, close the business on the fifth day, I don't immediately send it to the office to keep in mind. I wait until the next day um, just to give a little bit more time. And then by midday on the sixth day, I would send it to the office. So the main parts that an instructor would need to deal with are five, six, and seven here. So five is a description of the alleged violation. And you can attach supporting documentation if you have some. So an example here is student copied the answers to an assignment from the internet. Um, and maybe you would have documentation that shows where that exact answer was on the internet along with their answer. Um, and then number six is your proposed academic sanction. So here I've put a score of zero on the assignment is what I would like the consequence to be. Um, and it, here's the actual link to that sanctioning guidelines um, big chart. It's, a, it's a kind of intimidating, but once you start looking through it, it's very helpful actually for figuring out what to do. Number seven is the recommended disciplinary sanction, which um, is really the, the conduct sanction that an instructor can request. So if you believe it was so egregious that you want there to be a conduct sanction as well, then you could put one, you could put one in there. Um, generally, what we have found, I think I'm accurate in saying that instructors usually put in an academic sanction and leave the conduct sanction part to the Academic Integrity Committee. But you can put one in if you want to. Um, the student can contest both the charge, so whatever is a number five, and the sanction. So they can say, yes, I cheated, but the sanction is too strong. I don't think that's a fair sanction. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> It's also important to note that we are fully in charge of what the academic sanction will be as a college. The conduct sanctions we recommend to the Office of Student Conduct and then the final decision is theirs for those. Then that keeps things a little more consistent across the entire university. Okay, so what if the student contests? What do you have to do then? Um, there may be a hearing with the EMS Academic Integrity Committee. Most likely there will be a hearing, but if the student doesn't want one, they don't have to have one, but it, 
it would be kind of odd to contest but not want a hearing. So usually there will be a hearing. Um, you'll need to provide evidence of the infraction for the hearing. Anything in addition to what you, you supplied with the original form that you think makes the case stronger. The student can submit a letter and any evidence they have that supports their side of the story. Both sides see all of the evidence and arguments before the hearing. So you will get to see what the student is saying to counter you know, what their um, explanation is for what happened. You can attend the hearing in person or over the phone. Your attendance is separate from that of the student. So you don't have to worry about you know, both being there and having to argue back and forth. The student comes in, they tell their side, we ask questions, they leave, and then we engage with you. So I think that's a little bit nicer way for both sides probably for that to happen. And you are not required to attend. Um, after that, we will let you know the outcome, and that outcome is based on a preponderance of the evidence, which is a kind of a weaker standard than, than beyond a reasonable doubt. So if it's more likely than not that the student is uh, responsible for that violation, then we will find them responsible. It doesn't have to be like in the court system. Um, if they are found responsible, then you will apply the academic sanction you recommended after you're notified that the process has been completed. And we will also recommend any conduct sanction based on your recommendation, as well as the information about prior offenses. So we will kind of take care of the conduct sanction part. You don't really have to get involved with that if you want to. Um, it is important that you wait to apply an adjusted grade until after the process is complete and you've been notified of the outcome. So you can just leave it blank in Canvas or wherever you put your grades until, until you know how this turns out. And then put in either the original grade if they're found not responsible or you know, whatever the adjusted grade is if they are found responsible. Um, you might wonder too, can a student file an appeal? The decisions are by the uh, committee are final, so they cannot be appealed, unless in the most egregious cases where we would recommend dismissal from college programs, which is an academic sanction, that one can be appealed to the dean or the dean's representative. Um, conduct sanctions, again, are just sent to the Office of Student Conduct and they are resolved there um, and cannot be appealed. The process here is summarized in this flowchart that um, we have as a handout over there, and it will also be available on the website. I think it's still the old version right now, but the new version. Yeah. I think that depending again. Yeah. It also. Yeah. Yeah. And this was the one sent um, in email to all, of, all instructors in EMS as well. So you shouldn't have it in your email too. It's handy to have it in the Yeah. It's really handy to have that. Exactly what happens. So that is all I have for presentation. So we can move into the Q&A with the panel.